Welcome to the History of European Theatre podcast, and thanks for joining me on this journey through millennia of theatrical history. Episode 112, English Renaissance Conclusions, sort of. And so we come to the end of a season. But this is a bit of an odd conclusions episode because, quite obviously, we have not finished with this period yet. You will have noticed at least one or two glaring omissions in season 5, and that also, at times, the narrative has drifted all the way up to 1642 and the closures of the theatres. If ever there was a full stop to a cultural development, then that was it. But dividing the period broadly into the early Renaissance theatre and the later period, with all its mighty practitioners, seemed like a sensible approach at the start, and I think that still holds true. English theatre, as I've portrayed it so far, is very much only part way through the story, so in this episode I'll be looking back on the major developments and characters primarily from the earlier part of the period, which I hope will also serve as a reminder, should you need it, when we get to the ongoing story of the period. But first, there are three dropped threads that I need to pick up. I realised as I looked back over the episodes for the season that I had not given three playwrights the attention they deserved, but had only mentioned them in passing as collaborators with other playwrights, or commentators on their work. So, before concluding the season, let me correct those omissions now. Last episode, I mentioned Thomas Watson as a possible co-author of Arden of Faversham, but neglected to give you any of his biography. He's better known as a poet and an early writer of madrigals, that rather beautiful form of unaccompanied singing that uses intricate harmonies and counterpoint, and became very popular in the 16th and 17th century. But he also had some input to the theatre towards the end of the 1500s. Born in 1555 in London, but raised in Oxfordshire after the early death of his parents, he attended Winchester College and then Oxford University. He never formally graduated, but spent several years travelling in Europe, where he gained a reputation as a poet. He returned to London to study law, but again, he never became qualified or practised at the bar. There were poetry collections that were well regarded, but these are now lost, and his earliest surviving work is a Latin translation of Antigone. He was a friend of John Lilly, and some of his poems followed Lilly's ornate and mannered style. He also wrote sonnets, the most popular form of the day, which, many believe, influenced the poet-playwrights of the day, including Shakespeare. He also wrote plays. He was one of the playwrights mentioned in that list of Our Best for Tragedy in 1594, alongside Shakespeare, Johnson and Decker. But none of his plays have survived. Although more or less forgotten now, in his day, Watson was a significant figure. His association with Shakespeare over Arden of Faversham was strengthened when a 1595 reference to Shakespeare as Watson's heir was re-evaluated through study and became recognised in terms of Watson as a playwright. Another reference, this one from 1596, speaks of the froth of his witty jests and, given the strong vein of comedy that runs through Arden of Faversham, the argument for Watson's involvement becomes only stronger. Textual examination claims to show comparisons with Watson's surviving prose and poetic works, so it looks like Arden of Faversham could be a Watson play with assistance from a young Shakespeare. We only have one account with any detail from his life, which also involves Christopher Marlowe. The account is of a violent altercation, so far, so Marlowe but it does suggest that Watson was a friend of Marlowe and a close member of the Cambridge Wit set, despite being an Oxford man, and was living in London at the epicentre of theatre life. On the 18th of September 1589, Watson heard the crash of steel blades in the street and the shouts of a crowd. He rushed out of his house and found his friend Marlowe fighting ferociously with William Bradley, the son of an innkeeper. Marlowe was in a legal dispute with Bradley's father, but clearly things had got out of hand between Marlowe and Bradley Jr. Watson drew his sword and engaged with Bradley, giving Marlowe a chance to catch his breath. Watson was wounded and forced back into the ditch that ran alongside the street, but in a last desperate effort and fearing that he was about to die, Watson ran his sword right through Bradley. 
Marlow and Watson were both arrested for murder and thrown into prison. They pleaded self-defence and were probably lucky that William Bradley had a bad reputation for picking fights and they must have been supported by eyewitnesses to the fight. Marlow was released after two weeks. Watson, as the man who'd struck the fatal blow, had to wait for the formal pardon from the Queen, which took time to procure. In the end, he was in prison for three months before he was released. Watson died in September 1592, probably from the plague. Throughout the season, but particularly in association with Philip Henslow and Thomas Decker, the name of Henry Chettle has come up as a collaborator with other playwrights. But I never gave any details of his life or his other works, so let me correct that now. Born about 1564, Henry was the son of Robert Chettle, a London dyer who was also involved in publishing. He became a registered member of the Stationers' Company from 1584. Robert's name is associated as co-publisher with a poor-quality first quarto edition of Romeo and Juliet, as well as other plays, pamphlets and ballads. We don't have any details of Henry's early life and education, but we might surmise that he at least grew up in a literary atmosphere thanks to his father's influence. In 1592, Robert Greene's posthumous A Groat's Worth of Wit was published and registered with the stationer's office at the peril of Henry Chettle. Chettle denied that he had forged the work, as was being suggested, and placed himself more as a collector of Greene's last writings in a preface to his next work, where he said of A Groat's Worth of Wit, About three months since died Mr Robert Greene, leaving many papers in sundry booksellers' hands, among others, his groat's worth of wit, in which a letter written to diverse playmakers is offensively by one or two of them taken, and because on the dead they cannot be avenged, they willfully forge in their conceits a living author. With neither of them that take offence was I acquainted, and with one of them I care not if I never be. The other, whom at the time I did not so much spare as since I wish I had, for that, as I have moderated the heat of living writers, and might have used my own discretion, especially in such a case the author being dead, that I did not, I am sorry, as if the original fault had been my fault, because myself have seen his demeanour no less civil than he excellent in the quality he professes. Besides, divers of worship have reported his uprightness of dealing, which argues his honesty and his fastidious grace in writing that approves his art. One of those insulted authors was certainly Marlowe, who had been identified in the book with the serious charge of atheism, and of course Shakespeare with the famous upstart crow comment. The argument about whether this is Chettle's work or Green's has occupied many pages of scholarly study and flowed backward and forward over the years. Chettle continued to write pamphlets, but also has 38 plays where he is definitely identified as a contributor and a significant minority, 13 to be precise, of that number where he is credited as sole author. In 1598, he was mentioned as one of the best comic writers of the period, but like many playwrights at the time, he was both prolific and crossed genres with apparent ease. And by prolific, I mean involvement or sole authoring of those 36 plays between 1598 and 1603, just five years. These plays are all mentioned in Henslow's diary, as the theatre manager made various advance payments to Chettle and his co-authors. I mentioned some of these in the episode on Henslow's diary. He, like Marlowe and Decker, also seems to have been often in debt and on the edge of trouble with the authorities. Henslow paid a fine for him on at least one occasion, and on another he loaned Chettle money to get a play that he'd written back from a pawn shop. Despite that prolific output, only one play of his, The Tragedy of Hoffman, was printed. That, and what we know of his work, suggests that, like Decker, he was a good collaborator, but that his works were not as popular as Decker's, and he was not quite on the top rung of playwrights, but nevertheless popular enough in his day. Henslow certainly had faith in him and was prepared to bail him out when necessary, again, a lot like Decker. Perhaps Henslow was a soft touch when it came to his playwrights and a sucker for a sob story. We certainly get the impression that many of them lived on the edge 
and must have given Henslow a lot of worry as he tried to keep him on track and feeding the ever-demanding appetites of the theatre. Chettle died in 1607, and Thomas Decker wrote of him taking his place amongst the poets of Elysium, but then slaps down the compliment somewhat by describing the event as In comes Chettle, sweating and blowing by reason of his fatness. It's difficult to know if Chettle would have appreciated that particular bit of humour. Another name that I've mentioned frequently over the course of the season but not lingered on is that of Thomas Haywood. Most often he comes up as a commentator on the work of others and on the art of playing in general, but like Watson and Chettle, he is worthy of a mention in his own right. Haywood was born in the early 1570s, probably in Lincolnshire and possibly he was the son of playwright John Haywood, but this is all very speculative. There's a tradition that he attended Cambridge University, but the first firm mention of him is from Henslow's diary in October 1596, when payment for a play is noted. Within the next couple of years, he became an actor in The Admiral's Men, and, as there's never mention of any wages for him, it's assumed that he was a sharer in the company. It is likely that he authored his first play, The Four Prentices of London, in 1592, and then produced a string of plays to follow this, again crossing genres freely. He favoured comedies and romances, but arguably his best work was one of the two tragedies that he wrote, A Woman Killed with Kindness. This is sometimes considered part of the domestic tragedy genre, but although the setting is relocated to England, it takes its plotline from some Italian stories and is often classed as pure melodrama. The story concerns a wealthy country gentleman who marries an attractive young woman from a good family. She is engaged in an affair with his younger friend and frequent house guest. A loyal servant informs his employer of what is happening and although at first he is quite unbelieving of the situation, he grows more suspicious as he watches the couple until eventually he decides to set a trap which uncovers them asleep in each other's arms. He draws his sword but thinks better of simply killing them and he spares them in a generous act of Christian charity. He orders his wife to leave without their children, as he has no wish to see her ever again. Having sent her to another manor house that he owns, he later hears that she, filled with remorse for her actions, has been refusing food and is close to death. He rushes to her and arrives just in time to grant her forgiveness before she dies. Hayward's point seems to be that the husband had not punished her in the expected manner by violence and murder, but has killed her with his kindness nonetheless, and the question is whether his conduct really is more Christian and charitable than a quick death. The question of whether this is an ironical piece, or if Hayward's meaning is in fact quite straight, is still debated. His most admired comedy is The English Traveller from about 1627. Heavily influenced by Plautus, it concerns a young man returning from abroad to find that the girl he believed was waiting for him has in fact married a rich elderly suitor in his absence. As he believes himself still betrothed to the young woman, he vows to remain celibate rather than commit the sin of adultery, and he and the young woman promise to marry each other once the old man dies. Then he discovers that she is in fact having a secret affair with another man. He is outraged, but reasons that physical revenge will resolve nothing. Overcome by shame at her actions and his noble stance, she soon dies. You can hear some obvious similarities with A Woman Killed With Kindness, and the play is more interesting now as it seems to foreshadow the popular domestic melodramas of the 18th century and it omits the customary dancing and song that appeared in the vast majority of plays at the time. It's as if Hayward was trying to peel back the plays to just the essential elements of plot and meaning. Like Thomas Decker, his plays evoke the sights and sounds of their settings, particularly the City of London, and provide interesting material for social historians. As I've already mentioned and quoted in previous episodes, his commentary on his fellow actors and playwrights are of particular interest to theatre historians. Hayward continued to act through his life, becoming associated at different times with several playing troops, 
except for an odd five-year period from 1519, where he was absent from the stage for unexplained reasons. He seems to have been a very popular actor and playwright, while also finding time to churn out prose works, poetry and lengthy histories, including a chronicle of all the kings of England, from the mythical Brutus to Charles I. That last king was also said to like his work, visiting a performance of his comedy Love's Mistress three times in eight days. In his preface to The English Traveller, he looked back over his career and claimed to have had an entire hand, or at least a main finger, in 220 plays. Nothing to Lupe de Vega, but still impressive if true. As only 23 plays survive that can be confidently attributed to him as author or co-author, it's difficult to judge just how good the best of Haywood was, so it's likely that he will remain better remembered for his commentary on others rather than for his own work. In his last years, he was appointed poet to the City of London and organised the Lord Mayors and other pageants in the city. He died in 1642, probably in his late 60s and in the city. So now to a sort of conclusion to season five, the English Renaissance Theatre. How best, I was wondering, to sum up the events, places, plays, players and playwrights that I've covered in the last 25 episodes. How best to encapsulate this century of development in theatre. In our travels through the theatre of Renaissance England, we have gone from the tail end of the religious theatre of the medieval period into the period of public popular theatre and right into the heart of the flowering of the Elizabethan theatre and a little beyond. It is a lot to take in and perhaps that is the first thing that needs to be recognised, that this was a period of tremendous change in the arts and that change was a reflection of massive changes in the country. Ever since Anglo-Saxon times, England and the English crown had attempted to emulate and then be part of the European mainstream but arguably never quite made it there until the Tudor period. Then, England became an outward-looking country who could, and did at different times, hold its own against the great European powers of the time – France, Spain, the Papacy and the Holy Roman Empire. English theatre became greater and more influential than any other European theatre of the Renaissance period, and to summarise all of that, I'm just going to pick some main events and people who were part of that change and, in my view, contributed so significantly to it that we can say that without it, or them, theatre as we know it would not have happened. So first, we have the development of the public playhouses, both indoor and outdoor, being crucial to the development of popular theatre. Previously, the courtyards of inns, some private spaces and open fields for larger gatherings had provided theatre space. But it was James Burbage and his theatre, and then the curtain, that saw a way to bring theatre to a mass audience. Although kept by the authorities outside of the City of London, but close to it, and with a false start or two, the new open air and, perhaps more importantly, large theatre buildings where a big audience paying a low entrance fee could be accommodated soon became a commercial and popular success across all parts of society, literally from lords and ladies right down to anybody who could afford the penny entrance fee to stand in the yard in front of the stage. The effect was a unifying one, but one that still allowed for expression of social position by the inclusion of galleries and on-stage seats at higher prices. Mass entertainment had arrived in a city that was large enough and with a population diverse enough to support it, and allowed it to flourish. Burbage, Henslow, Allen and other theatre builders provided the buildings that enabled the art of playing and playwriting to develop, and without them and the craftsmen who built theatres to their instruction, theatre as we know it would not have happened. The players themselves are quite clearly an integral factor in the success of theatre. They carried the torch for the art through difficult times, many difficult times, and kept this kind of mimetic storytelling alive. They had to adapt to new circumstances, but were often brave enough to be directly in the firing line for any approbation that came from the state or the church or both. 
Proving that adaptability, they toured at times of plague and, in some cases, suffered jail time and other humiliations for their art. But they also gave voice and action to some of the greatest moments in the history of theatre. And given the collaborative nature of play production in the period, it's difficult to think that they didn't also have a huge influence on the plays themselves. In fact, we know they did, just in the way that parts were written for them and in some cases, they became synonymous with them. The greats, like Kemp and Allen and Burbage, have names that still resonate in the theatre today. And I think that there can be little doubt that from the very start of public commercial theatre, the importance of the charismatic lead actor was absolutely essential to the success of theatre. Were it not for the players, be they the stars of the show or the players in the troupe, theatre as we know it would not have happened. The role of the state in the development of theatre is a very complex area and boiling it down to a simple statement about cause and effect is probably not possible. I think we can question to what degree the restrictions placed on theatre actually did curtail it and to what degree they encouraged it. This was the first time that the state had to deal with a form of popular mass entertainment that wasn't essentially a religious event, and certainly it had the potential to be the catalyst for public unrest. The concerns of the state, which in simple terms focused on matters of public health and public behaviour, appear quite draconian to us now and certainly use some of the toughest censorship rules ever imposed and some of the harshest punishments ever meted out. But that wasn't unusual for the time. Thanks to the rules they lived under, playwrights and players had firm boundaries that they nevertheless pushed at. Their story is one of constant testing of what was permissible, but also one of skilfully adapting to the constraints that they were placed under. And, I think, it's fair to say, without these constraints and the attempt to break or circumvent them that the playwrights and the players and the theatre owners were forced to take, theatre as we know it would not have happened. The growth of university education and, one might argue, the growth of education in general also plays a role in the development of theatre. It isn't just that the young men now had access to learning about Roman and Greek literature and art, but that they were given a space to exchange ideas and the tools with which to conduct these debates. That influence can also be extended to the inns of court where men studying and then practising law also became some of the earliest secular playwrights in which their companions acted and provided the key component of the audience for their works. The intention behind the expansion of education may have been to produce clerics for the church and administrators for an expanding bureaucracy, but for some at least, the door was opened to artistic expression. It was, we must remember, from the inns of court that the whole period was kick-started with plays like Gorbyduck. Cambridge University is particularly significant because of the way its alumni gathered in London, became a recognised group of working artists, the Cambridge Wits, and produced some of the best plays of the period. Without them, and the education that underpinned their work, theatre as we know it would not have happened. Looking at the influences on the playwrights, it is, I think, impossible to underestimate the influence of pamphlets, prose and poetry. Most of the playwrights wrote poetry, the primary form of literature for the period, and not just for including in their theatrical works, but for publication and more private consumption. Many playwrights, like Nash, Green and Kidd, were also pamphleteers, this being a form where they were able to criticise those in power or in positions of popularity and take them down a peg or two in a satiric mode. Playwrights who published prose works are less prominent because of the dominance of poetry, but works that have survived, by the likes of Thomas Decker and Thomas Hayward, give us a lot of useful information about the period and specifically about theatre. Plays were recognised as ephemeral and entertainment for the masses, and would never replace poetry as the favoured literary form, but they did develop into more sophisticated pieces, and in the process, plays, we might say, became the fourth P in that list, and without those other influences, theatre as we know it would not have happened. 
Of the Cambridge set, Christopher Marlowe stands out as an influential author who, if we are reading the runes correctly, took the poetic declamatory form of the early secular plays and turned it into a truly dramatic form. That is the difference we see between Tamburlaine and Dr Faustus. But his new wasn't all new. He also took some of the best parts of medieval theatre and crafted poetic plays around very exciting and very visual plot lines. His crafting of poetry, and particularly his adopting of iambic pentameter within Marlowe's mighty line, led the way for others who put it to even better use. But he showed the way, and something of its potential. But of course, what also fascinates about Marlowe is his life story, with all the associated mystery about what exactly he was up to, and how far he was involved with the significant political figures of the time. Through his life, we get a sense of how brutal London life could be and how a life could be cut short in an angry moment. The lost potential in his case is palpable, and without him, I think, we can say with confidence that theatre as we know it would not have happened. I would also list the City of London itself as a significant influence on theatrical development. The city at the time was well-regulated, cosmopolitan, compact and yet populous enough to support theatre of various kinds. London's special position in the country and the fact that in many respects it set its own rules independently of the crowns meant that theatre was permitted and tolerated in ways that would not have happened elsewhere. It had its detractors, of course, many of them were vermin in their protests. But London always had an eye on the commercial possibilities, and the early theatre builders were entrepreneurs and businessmen, who could find influential ears amongst the guildsmen and the aldermen of the city when they needed to. London, because of its commercial power and therefore as a source of wealth to the Crown, held some power over the Queen. Its diverse population supported theatre week in and week out, and gave playwrights and players, as we can imagine, very immediate feedback to their offerings. Without London, theatre as we know it would not have happened. And I feel that I should also mention some of the lesser-known playwrights from the period in this list too. Thomas Kidd and Thomas Decker spring to mind as two of the lesser-known writers who nevertheless deserve a mention. Our problem here is the lack of information about their lives and, in Kidd's case at least, not much work to go on. But The Spanish Tragedy is a seminal play of the early period and, judging by contemporary comments and references to it, much admired by other playwrights and influential on them. Thomas Decker is a prime example of a prolific, popular and respected playwright in the period who is now more or less unknown to us. He also sits with a group of playwrights who seemed incapable of staying out of debt and out of prison, which certainly adds a lot to the spice of their life stories, but leaves one wondering what more they could have achieved had they managed to curtail some of their excesses. If we classify these men in the mid-range of playwrights, we are being a little unkind to them. But for a turn of fate, a different choice here or there, they could have been up there with the best and still performed today. Collectively, they make up the majority of what was popular to the contemporary audience, and without them, I think it's fair to say that theatre as we know it would not have happened. There are periods in history where countries make great leaps forward, where people find ways to invent and then embrace new technologies, to grab hold of new ideas and old ideas rediscovered. Those changes are met by people who take what went before and either by building on it or throwing it out completely, create something new, something that grabs the popular imagination and becomes something very special that is never lost again. But that all needs men, and now thankfully we can say men and women, who can turn their talent to that process. People who have the vision and enthusiasm and belief in what they can create. And yes, maybe they do it for the money or for fame and for glory and the adulation of the crowd, but that doesn't make their work valueless. I would contend that the playwrights of the English Renaissance period laid the groundwork for plays still being written today. The theatre builders of the period invented and reinvented designs that are still the basis for theatre buildings we use today. The players laid the foundation for the acting profession that is still followed today. 
No one working in or being a recipient of Western theatre can ignore the impact of the theatre of the Renaissance period in England. The problem for me has been that the impact and the influence of this period on the rest of theatre history is so great that I find it impossible to sum it up effectively. It's just too big. But I hope I have at least given you lots of food for thought and a good basis for what comes next. So there we are, a sort of conclusion to the theatre of the English Renaissance. Next season we will be somewhat in the same period and more or less in the same place. There is, as I'm sure you know, lots more to say. Not least about possibly the greatest and certainly the most influential playwright of all time. But before that, and coming next, one more episode as a coda to this season and a prelude to the next. In the meantime, please join the Facebook page or group or find the podcast on Instagram or X to keep up to date with new episodes and other theatre-related stuff. You can find details of ways to support the podcast at the website, which is www.thehistoryofeuropeantheatre.com. If you do feel able to help out with the costs of running the podcast, then please head over to Patreon, where you can find additional content for a small monthly fee or a one-off donation. You can also find all the details about that on the website. I look forward to your company next time, but if you have any comments or concerns in the meantime, you can contact me by email at thoetp at gmail.com or via x at thoetp. Thank you.